So this week, what we're looking at is individual difference and strategic choice of top executives. So the chapter that we're basing this on is chapter three of Finkelstein, and it's how individual differences affect executive decision. Just so you're aware, from this point onward for the rest of the semester, all of the readings will be coming from Finkelstein, okay? So that will keep it fairly straightforward. The previous weeks, we just wanted to set up some core basic knowledge of strategic management because you'll need to tap into this as you move into and understand this as you move further on into the semester. So we were just setting up the groundwork or the basics around that. A key aspect of this week is the concept of bounded rationality. And bounded rationality is the idea that, that we make decisions that are rational, but really they're within limits of information available and our mental capabilities. So this is really important to understand from a strategic leadership perspective because at the head of the organisations are the people who make the leaders, so the top executives, the CEOs, the board of directors. Um, they all make decisions and it's all bound by rationality. So understanding that they take it based on the, on the information they receive and the heuristics or the thinking that they approach and their capabilities at a mental level. And yeah, have a look at um, the Herbert Simon video because Herbert Simon came up with the concept of bounded rationality. Uh, he won a Nobel um, Prize for it. He's a Nobel laureate. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting concept that we don't just make decisions based on everything, we actually narrow it down. The concept of bounded rationality is really looking at the idea that when we make decisions, we are limited by our thinking, uh, we are limited by the information that we have on hand, we might be limited by the time that we have to make the decision as well. So these are what is known as constraints. So we have our rational decision and the assumption would be that we know absolutely everything, we have everything at our fingertips and we can make a perfect decision. Whereas in reality, we know that that's not the case because we don't know everything. And even if we did know everything, we would narrow it down, um, we would translate it into certain ways, we wouldn't be able to compute it properly to draw in every single aspect. So as humans, what we do is we try and make the best decision in the time that we have with the knowledge that we have and to the best of our abilities. And that really is underlying the concept of bounded rationality. We're calculating that best course of action whether and drawing in on time, information and personal attributes. So underpinning all of this is that concept of bounded, bounded rationality. So when we're looking at strategic choice for top executives under the concept of bounded rationality, what we're really trying to do is understand the lens through which our top executives make decisions. So what you can see here is a model that basically looks like a funnel. And at the one end, we see the strategic situation. And this is all the different aspects that they should be taking into account or that occurs that can influence the decision making and direction of the organisation. Within that, if you see executive orientation, that is basically the internal or the person elements of the person making or the top executive making the decision. So it's broken up into two parts. The first is the psychological factors and a key aspect of that is around values. The second part is the cognitive model. So what kind of model do they adopt when they're thinking? And then third, what is the style? What approach do they take to thinking and decision making? And fourth, what is their personality? So their personality might tap into things around risk, for example. Are they averse? Do they embrace it? All of this can come into play. Then we've got the observable experiences um, down the bottom. And this can be things like, well, their age. If they're a young CEO, um, you know, they may not have the same experience as someone who's been in the job for 20 years. So how long they've been doing the role, where their experience comes from. So do they come from a financial perspective or a marketing perspective or an IT perspective? This can all influence the way they approach decision making from a bounded rationality perspective. 
Other factors can include their formal education and also their background in terms of their function, what they did previously, which I've mentioned. And then there are also a number of other factors as well. So gender might even play, play a part in this or other diversity issues. This then means that as part of the filtering process, when they're taking the information at hand that they need to draw on, when they're bound by perhaps time as well and how quickly they can get all this together and make the decision, um, and as well as their own um, mental capabilities, this limits their field of vision. So if they had a finite amount of time, for example, then they could draw in all the strategic situation, but they don't have that or it may not be available. If, for example, their mental capabilities limit them from viewing from different perspectives, they may only stick to one path. From there, they've chosen their selective perception. So they've gone, this is what I believe to be true. They've made an interpretation of it, which turns into their reality. So what happens is because people view things from their perspective, that becomes their reality or their way that they have made sense of a situation. So this concept of construed reality is that we may all be looking at the same situation, but from different perspectives based on our background, based on our viewpoint, based on the information that we've had at hand. This then leads into the choices that are then made by the top executive and also their behaviour. So how do they act in situations? How do they make their, how have their decisions or their choices been made? And lastly, those choices and those behaviours form into the performance of the organisation. So what we're saying here is that top executives like are humans at the end of the day and are affected by bounded rationality, just as we all are. Um, they, However, their decisions that they make, the choices that they make, the behaviours that they show can influence an organisation's performance overall. And this leads ultimately into the area of organisational outcomes. So you would hope a CEO level, um, their strategic choices, um, they're able to draw on the right elements quickly. They're able to understand that their own interpretation might mean that they don't view things the same way all the time and, and look at it from different perspectives. So ultimately what we want is for them to lead into um, what is best organisational performance? How can we understand how a top executive's decision-making process under the rules of bounded rationality actually narrows down the situation um, and can affect ultimately affect organisational performance? What's important to note around the filtering process is that um, we see this as a very linear process when it's discussed in the textbook, when you see it on this slide, for example, but what can actually happen is the field of vision, which is limited and specific focus of attention and the networks of contact, so things that they draw information from, the selective perception is what they actually notice out of that. So, for example, we often notice things in the world once we've started talking about it, so similar kind of thing. An interpretation is how we make meaning around it this can actually change in order. It doesn't always need to be sequential. You might have a selective perception and then go back to your field of vision as things change, and then that ultimately changes your interpretation. So this filtering process, don't take into account that it is exactly as you see it in a linear process, but it can change, it can evolve and move around. All of this actually leads to the concept of the construed reality. So it may not, a top executive's perspective um, of construed reality, so this is the way they view the situation, may not actually be based on complete analytics data facts. It can also draw in intuition. Um, it can also tap into the concept that um, their view is the right view and therefore want to discount other um other perspectives or other insights as well if they've got the evidence to support the path that they want to follow. So therefore, if we really want to understand the decision-making process with organisations, the performance of the organisations and ultimately the strategic choices made, we really, really do need to understand the um, top executives and how they approach these aspects. 
So when we're doing the understanding the strategic choices, understanding um, how strategic choices and organisational performance is made, a key part of what we need to look at in a top executive is their executive orientation. And there are two aspects to that. The first one is the psychological prop properties that they have. And an example of this is that, say, for example, um, the CEO likes to know everything, likes to monitor and control everything, then therefore they're more likely to centralise services within the organisation so that it runs through one central peer as opposed to have multiple groups and units that it is not as um, cohesively contained. So that can really affect what the, um, what the top executive's preferences and what their values are and what drives them, even their ego and their sense of achievement, can really drive how an organisation is structured and therefore ultimately the way in which they perform. So the second aspect is the observable experience. And these are things like the tenure of their CEO um, or their role in a CEO position. These are the... Um, work experience that they've had and the background that they come from, their educational experience as well, um, and also what's occurred in their past in their careers. So for example, we know that if they've had experiences previously where they've taken risk and it hasn't been successful, there's a good chance then they will actually exhibit risk averse behaviour within their top executive role within the organisation, which will ultimately influence the way they approach decision making and the way they um, that performance is measured. So they might go with a more slow and steady approach than trying to grab um, market share by doing things that um, are high risk. Another really interesting point around that is that when they're promoted from within, they're less likely to make high risk decisions than when they are brought in from external and they'll make those decisions and make those moves much quicker. Okay, so there are three key aspects to psychological characteristics that we're going to touch on. The first is executive values. The second is cognitive models and the third is personality. All of these aspects combined will influence the way the top executive or the CEO makes the decision that they make and ultimately drive organisational performance. Values are a really interesting area to look at because these are um, ongoing, they're long term and fundamentally even if they don't currently stick to the values, this is something that the top executive actually aspires toward. So what happens is an executive basically implements their course of action based on their value preferences. So if they are collectivist, for example, we're working together in multiple elements, then they will make decisions that lean toward that. Where they're into power, they will make decisions that lean toward that. So it's really important to understand that there are multiple dimensions of executive values where we need to understand the background of it. So what is the value then? Where does this value come from? What has driven the decision to focus on this value by the top executive? And then third, what kind of values are there? And whether it's collectivism, rationality, novelty, duty, materialism and power. All of these and the combination of how these work together can have a, a, a solid impact on strategic choice, which, as I keep mentioning, goes back to the way that the organisation performs. So if we look at each value dimension a little bit closer, collectivism is about working together. It's about looking at humankind and social systems and respect for all people. So often um, corporate social responsibility strategies stem from collectivism um, traits that a CEO might have. The second one is rationality. To what degree do they make decisions without letting emotions come into play? Are these logical decisions as well? The third one is novelty. And novelty is where they value change, they value new, they push things, they innovate, they like to see what they can do. And then, you know, if it doesn't work, they'll pull it back. But if it works, they'll adopt it moving forward. So there's a degree of risk involved with novelty um, as well. But they like seeing what they can do and how they can extend it and do it differently if possible. 
duty is all around obligation and loyalty. So some work, um, some organisations, particularly in family-run businesses, they have large loyalties to their workforce and to each other, and this can often drive the decision making and the strategic choice because they think of it within context of where does their duty lie. Um, what do they need to reflect on and protect or look after? So that's why it, when family um, businesses have to let go employees, that they actually find it a bit harder because they treat everyone as family. Materialism refers to how much they value wealth and how much they value the um, tangible possessions. So what do they need to do uh, in terms of growing their wealth, growing the organisation's sense of wealth, and also the tangible possessions that come with it, so the stuff. So how much do they want, you know, the big screen TVs, the modern new office building, the, the forward-thinking working spaces that they can say to others. There is a connection between materialism and ego as well, and there's also a connection between um, power and ego too. So power refers to the control of situations and people. Some CEOs and top execs are happy to trust their senior management team to drive their aspect of strategy and the direction of the um, organisation. Other CEOs and top execs like to be very much more hands-on, like to be part of the decision-making process at a more micro level and therefore have, want to have much more control over what's happening within the organisation. There's no good or bad in power, it's just how it approaches things and some people, um, the way they tap into power and they, they feed off it through their ego and stuff can make it difficult but the reality is that to a degree we all have some kind of aspect of power that we do tap into. How we use it though and how it's utilised within the way we make strategic choices can differ, okay? So power can be shared or power can be held quite close or a combination of in-between or depending on where the knowledge lies. So some CEOs are experts in some areas, so they tend to want more power in that area. It, can all, it, it all varies. There's no one set way, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. Ultimately, though, these executive values do affect the uh, top executives' field of vision and what they are aware of. So lots of the time when executives are out of their comfort zone, they will hold on to the things that they do know about um, very closely because that makes them feel like they are more in control. So looking at the concept of cognitive models, this is a really interesting space. Basically, it's trying to understand how the decisions are made, how the thoughts are processed within someone's mind, um, and also they're trying to understand where does the concept of bounded rationality fit into all of this, as well as how does biases and heuristics play a part. So biases are things that we tend to believe and therefore uh, it can cloud our vision. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that we take in order to get to a quicker decision. So for example, on a really, really simple level, we tend to um, use habit a lot when we go grocery shopping and we buy the same brand of milk, for example, all the time because we trust it, and therefore that's our mental shortcut, our heuristic. Whereas biases can range a whole bunch, across a whole bunch of different things and we can show our, um, we can have biased behaviour and make assumptions based on our biases which can then cloud or influence our decision. There's hundreds of different kinds of biases out there. There are a few really, really popular ones and these can include age-related biases, gender-related biases, um, the assumptions that we make around certain religions, for example, the way we select information, um, all of these can play a part. There's so many different biases that a person can have and we all have them, okay? That's probably a key point to be aware of is that everyone has biases because of the way they view and frame the world. Okay, so moving on from biases and heuristics, um, let's look at there are three different aspects within a cognitive model. And the first one is the cognitive content. And this is basically what the executive knows. So what information do they know? What is their knowledge? What, how, you know, um, what do they draw on in their minds? What have they remembered? What do they know? The second one is the structure. And this is the way that they're... Um, 
their thinking or their knowledge and beliefs are arranged in their mind. So how do they put things together? How are ideas connected in their head? What kind of process or logic or structure do they put into play? And the third one is the concept of executive uh, cognitive style. And that looks at how an executive's mind works. So what aspects do they tap into or how do they approach certain activities? One size fits all kind of model. This varies from person to person. It's more about having the parameters in play to understand how these top executives actually work through strategic choices and decision making. So it's a fairly complex phenomenon after all. Um, you know, our brains are amazing. The way we think about things is really amazing. So no surprises there. So something I would like to draw your attention on in regard to cognitive style is the four types of executives, table 3.2 from page 67 of the textbook. And this really looks at a mode of judgment, so whether they are thinking or feeling, and also their mode of perception. So how do they view things, whether it's sensation or intuition? So based on that, you can come up with different cognitive styles of a top executive. And that includes having a coaching style, having a visionary style, having an administrator style, and then having a strategist style. Okay, and we can loosely um, put CEOs based on their profile of the previous things into one of these styles. Okay, so the last thing I want to touch on before we finish up the video is around executive personality. And we can break it down into three key parts. The first part is charisma, the second part is locus of control, and the third part is the positive self-regard. So when we do this, we don't look at them inherently as separate aspects per se, but really it's how they combine together that create the personality of the executive overall. There are other aspects of personality that come into play, but research has found that these three key areas are the most important. There's been a lot of research done around the concept of charisma within um, leadership and executive strategy, um, and that's a really interesting one because, once again, it can extend the boundaries of an organisation, it can extend the profile, it can also mean that the organisation is very much a, an extension of the leader and vice versa. So a classic example is where Steve Jobs had a lot of charisma, whereas Tim Cook doesn't have the same level of charisma, so he can't draw on that as much. Charisma can help you or help top executives um, get uh, getting their way and getting people to work on what they want to work. So they can switch, like it's almost like a charm or they can really connect on what feels like a personal level, but for them it's just about working through with other people. So they do try and connect at a personal level. So the locus of control can also play a key part. So some top executives may see that there is a lot of things outside of their control, therefore they can't influence or change. Whereas others can see that, well, actually there's a, um, a lot within my control that I'll be able to drive the direction of. The ones who have that kind of internal orientation will actually generally have a higher performance than an external orientation. And the last area is positive self-regard. Basically, positive self-regard is made up of a combination of different personality dimensions that um, it's almost like a meta construct that you can draw on in order to understand how much a CEO or a top executive has of positive self-regard. So what it can range from is basically um, core self-evaluation, so looking at how they evaluate themselves in context of things, how they um, approach different situations from an emotional stability, generated self-efficacy, -eff locus of control and self-esteem aspects. So these can mean things like how much do they agree with statements such as I am worthy, I am free from anxiety, I succeed at tasks and life's events are within my control. So you've got something there around core self-evaluation, then you've got narcissism. This is where they tend to put themselves first and it overrides everything else. They are at the centre of everything. 
um, and it, it is basically all around them. You've got hubris and you've also got overconfidence where they believe they can do something even though they may not have dealt with this before or had experience of it in the past or anything like that. So all of these aspects of positive self-regard can really play a part. Ego can play a part. The textbook talks about a great example of Jean-Marie Messier, um, who moved an energy company, France's, one of France's biggest energy companies, and tried to move it into entertainment around Vivendi. And when it failed, um, ac academics were trying to understand what went wrong and how it went wrong. And basically it came down to his colourful personality. He was self-absorbed. He was egomaniacal. And he was highly, so highly narcissist, narcissistic. He was full of self-admiration. Um, yeah, so and wanted to create drama that would have created more admiration. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that can come into play about um, what how personality can actually drive um, strategic choices and understanding how executives approach strategic choices and also organisational performance. Okay, basically to summarise, what we've been talking about in this lecture is how do individual aspects of a CEO or a top executive can actually influence the way strategic choice and strategic management occurs within an organisation and ultimately lead to the level of strategic performance that they achieve. So we've touched on both the psychological aspects as well as their experiences and we've also looked at how decision makers really filter down this information and, and try and narrow it and put their own lens or own construed reality on it. And then what we've done is we've looked at executive values, um, cognitive models and the three personality factors, charisma, locus of control and positive self-regard and also tried to understand how what they are and how they influence strategic decision making within an individual making those decisions. So all of this together looks at that internal or that internal drive of the top executive or CEO and understands what might influence them as they go through their strategic choice. And as mentioned before, the way these things are combined can actually affect the direction of the organisation and can vary from top executive to top executive or CEO to CEO. So um, what might one person do and be driven by might be different to how a diff another CEO, what they do and what they are driven by. So it's really important to understand how these, how these change and these differences can occur between CEOs. Even within the same industry, it can change. Okay, so that's about it on all of this. Have a read through, reread through the um, chapter of the textbook. It's um, it can be a little bit dense in parts, but the overarching understanding is trying to get inside the head of the top executive and see how they approach decision making and strategic choice. Okay, thank you. Bye.